Did you know? There's over 30 known Super Mario games that never saw the light of day. In this video, we'll be going through them all, with some exceptions. We'll leave out games that were rumored to exist but have no reputable proof that they were real, like Mario Kart VB, a reputed Mario Kart game for the Virtual Boy, as well as games that were just earlier versions of release titles, like Super Mario RPG 2 an early title for Paper Mario. We'll also be leaving out games in the Donkey Kong franchise, unless they're related to the original DK Arcade title which Mario first appeared in. But let's get to it. Starting with a few recent discoveries, data backups from Nintendo's archives have been leaking online over the past few years, and in July 2021, the tenth set of data from the Nintendo archives was leaked on 4chan, containing material such as the Wii SDK source code and various builds from Pokemon games. Deep within this data, however, was a document detailing 10 prototypes for the Nintendo Wii, two of which were based on Mario. The first prototype, Koopa Troopa Forest, was a top-down game where players avoid turtles by throwing stones and shooting bullets at them. The second, Mario FPS, is an FPS that takes place in Isle Delfino. Neither of these games have playable ROMs available and only exist as black-and-white photos found in the document. In that same leak, however, a spreadsheet mentions DDR Mario 2 for the Wii, presumably a sequel to Dance Dance Revolution Mario Mix. The game was going to be developed by Konami and was listed as not started yet. It's unknown if any development on the game started, however it's worth noting that a Mario Mix sequel announcement was rumored in 2005, which we covered in our recent Mario Rumors video. While newly discovered titles are always fascinating, let's go back a bit to the oldest game on our list. In 1982, less than a year after the release of the original arcade Donkey Kong, bedroom coders Wayne Westmoreland and Terry Gilman created a personal port of Donkey Kong for the TRS-80 model of computers. The TRS-80 was one of the earliest mass-market home computers. This made a fully functional TRS-80 port of Donkey Kong with all four levels that much more impressive. Despite being finished, the game would never release, as the duo couldn't get permission from Nintendo to publish it. But in 1995, Wayne Westmoreland released all of his titles to the public domain, including the final build of this unreleased port as an extra surprise. Another lost title is Donkey Kong no Ongaku Asobi an educational game designed to teach young players about music. The game had two modes. One was Music Quiz, a memory game where Mario and Pauline hammered notes on a piano while Donkey Kong played music, and the other was Donkey Band, a karaoke game starring Pauline where players sing into the microphone on the second Famicom controller. Music Play would have been the third title in the Famicom Play trilogy were it to be released in December 1983, coinciding with Popeye's English Play and Donkey Kong Jr. Math. In 2016, Ichi Hiro Sakurada, once a developer at Hudson Soft, revealed on Twitter that there were three reasons why Music Play got scrapped. Its gameplay was weak, it took up too much space on the cart, and it used music from Japanese singer Seiko Matsuda, which Nintendo never had legal permission to use. After its cancellation, a sample cartridge containing a late build of Music Play was sent to Hudson during development of the Family Basic Interpreter. Since Hudson shut down in 2012, it's unknown where the cartridge is presently. From 1983 to 1983, 1984, Atari created the Atari Soft branding to publish games on competitors' home computers such as the Commodore 64 and Apple II. The brand mainly focused on conversions of arcade games such as Pole Position, Moon Patrol, and even Mario Brothers. California-based developer Designer Software was contracted to create Mario Brothers ports for the C64, VIC-20, Apple II, and DOS computers. All four of these ports were completed, but due to Warner selling Atari's consumer division to former Commodore boss Jack Tramiel in 1984, Atari Soft got discontinued and none of these ports were released. According to designer software programmer Jimmy Huey in a 2005 interview with Retro Gaming Times Monthly, Atari's quality assurance reported a giant list of bugs in his finished product, which seemed odd to him as he viewed the game as relatively bug-free. Jimmy theorizes that this could be a way to justify the cancellation. A cracked version of the Apple II port was leaked in the 80s and spread around via piracy, while Commodore 64 had a different, unrelated port in the UK years later done by Ocean Software. Note that home computer versions of Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. were also being developed by Atari Soft, but were also cancelled for the same reason. Atari was also planning to release Mario Brothers on the Atari XE computer, the final model in their line of 8-bit computers. The hardware used on these systems was identical to that of the then-new Atari 5200, so programmer Bob Merrill converted his 5200 work to 
the XE. Despite being shown off at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in 1983, the port would not see release until 1988 when Atari put out several titles that got previously scrapped. However, what released wasn't Merrill's game, but rather a completely new version created by Sculptured Software. It's unknown as to why Atari did this, but some have theorized that they may have lost the source code to the original port. Thankfully, a near-final prototype of Merrill's game was found and released on the internet by Atari enthusiast and preservationist Matt Reichert. In mid-1987, British game publisher Firebird attempted to pitch a Commodore 64 port of Super Mario Bros. to Nintendo. Developers Gary Lydon and Gary Penn created a demo in just a few weeks, with Lydon rebuilding the first level from scratch, while Penn eyeballed the graphics off a television. Impressed with their work, a developer at fellow UK publisher Telecomsoft contacted Nintendo to see if they wanted to work with Firebird. Nintendo said no, and the project got dropped. Interestingly though, Firebird also attempted a Mario clone for the Commodore 64 titled Crucial Brothers a few years later, albeit with different developers, but this did not go anywhere either. In September 1990, years before Doom's creation, id Software developers John Carmack, John Romero, Adrian Carmack, and Tom Hall attempted to port Super Mario Bros. 3 to DOS computers. The group, then known as Ideas from the Deep, or IFD, recreated the first level of Mario 3 from scratch and substituted Mario with Dangerous Dave, a character previously seen in Apple II titles by John Romero. This demo was jokingly referred to as Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement and was possible due to a unique scrolling technique Carmack created that redrew each changed tile every frame, rather than the entire screen. After spending 72 straight hours polishing up the demo, it sent a copy of the game to Nintendo of America for approval. As John Romero recalls, the prototype made its way to the company offices in Kyoto, where it got rejected, as they did not want their intellectual property on anything but their hardware. Nevertheless, Nintendo was impressed with their work. Not wanting to put their scrolling technique to waste, the technology would find its way to the next title by id, Commander Keen and Invasion of the Vorticons. A few copies of the demo were passed around the industry on floppy disk, and in July 2021, a copy was donated to the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, where it was safely preserved. One of the most mysterious games on our list is Mario's Planet Quest. In July of 2021, Andrew Borman, digital games curator at the previously mentioned Strong Museum of Play, uncovered a game called Mario's Planet Quest, listed on the resume of a former software toolworks developer. The only information given was that it was developed for the Super Nintendo and was an educational game similar to Mario's Time Machine, which the developer also listed on their resume. Given the title, it's a safe bet that the game would have revolved around Mario traveling to space and learning about the solar system, clicking on objects for more information. Software Toolworks composer Mark Knight lists a similar game on his website called Mario's Mission Earth, which is likely the same game as the one uncovered by Borman. Super Mario's Wacky Worlds was a platform game developed by Nova Logic for the ill-fated Philips CDI console. Planned as a successor to Super Mario World, the game follows Mario as he treks through jungles, castles, cities, ancient Greece, and ancient Egypt. As you can see from the unfinished prototype that was dumped online, the game is very rudimentary, with Mario being unable to swim, collect power-ups, or be hurt by enemies. Comanche developer Nova Logic made an early one-level demo of the game in under two weeks, with programmer Silas Warner of Castle Wolfenstein fame and John Brooks leading the project. After getting approval from Philips, the group continued their work, aiming to create something that stayed true to the series. However, due to several staff leaving the company and the poor sales of the CDI, Wacky Worlds was scrapped. In an interview with researcher Frank Gasking for the book The Games That Weren't, Novologic artist Nina Stanley said, I think the real reason that Wacky Worlds was cancelled was due to changes in personnel. The lead engineer on the project, John Brooks, decided to leave and work for EA. When a replacement programmer wasn't found to continue the project, I also left and went to EA, and the game was ultimately cancelled. According to Stanley, around 80% of the art and 30% of the programming were completed before production halted. At least four prototypes of Wacky Worlds are known to exist, with one being sold on eBay in 2002 for over $1,000. Another unreleased game for the CDI is Mario Takes America. Around 1994, Toronto-based developer Sigum Entertainment pitched an educational title starring Mario to Phillips where he traveled across the United States to learn more about places like New York, Niagara Falls, and Hollywood. The game would have featured live-action FMV of these locations, with a 2D Mario rendered over it Roger Rabbit style. The live-action backgrounds took up most of the game's memory, making it a hard project
project for the programmers, one of which reportedly left Sigum fewer than three weeks after being hired. While doing research for this video, Did You Know Gaming was able to get in touch with animation director Michael Borthwick, who told us a little more about the game's production. Borthwick told us, Many sequences were done, but it was taking very long to get things working properly as the machine really could not handle what we were trying to do. Sigum founder Howard Greenspan likely failed to realize the limits of the machine right off the bat and kept over promising the look and playability of the game to Phillips. For example, we had a full 12 frame Mario walk cycle that had to be reduced to 6 frames because the CDI player could not handle playing 12 frames plus video plus collision detection plus the other sprites. Late in development, Sigum tried creating a backup game that replaced Mario with Sonic the Hedgehog. A second backup game was also made with two original characters, a rock and roll duo named Heavy and Metal. Not impressed by their work, Phillips cut all funding, and the game was quickly cancelled. Sigum would file for bankruptcy in 1994, and most of the company's assets were repossessed by the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Around late 1994, Argonaut Software pitched a 3D platforming game for the Super Nintendo titled Yoshi Racing. An unidentified artist at the company created a non-playable demo of the dinosaur running around an obstacle course, which would have used the same super effects technology seen in games like Star Fox and Stunt Race FX. Argonaut co-founder Jez Sand sent videos of the demo to Nintendo hoping for approval, but much to his dismay, they got rejected. Along with the recent cancellation of Star Fox 2, this response is considered a stake in Argonaut's departure from the company. A few years later, Nintendo would come out with a 3D platformer of their own, Super Mario 64. In a 2013 Eurogamer article, San alleged that Nintendo borrowed the 3D platforming concept from Argonaut, claiming that Shigeru Miyamoto thanked him for the idea at a trade show. It is unknown how accurate this claim is, as no one other than San and Miyamoto would be able to confirm it. In 1997, Argonaut released an original 3D platformer for Windows, PlayStation 1, and Sega Saturn, Croc, Legend of the Gabos. Rumors have circulated that Yoshi was the inspiration for Croc's design. Lead designer Nick Cussworth refutes this, saying that Croc's appearance came from a series of doodles by Argonaut IT member Simon Keating. In July of 2020, shortly following the infamous Nintendo Giga leak on 4chan, a single Super FX model of Yoshi was found deep within its files. Contrary to popular belief, this model had zero relation to Yoshi Racing and was likely used for a different project entirely. At the 1995 Winter Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, a tech demo was unveiled for the then-new Virtual Boy, called Mario Brothers VB. The single-level demo had three different modes, a side-scroller where you could move between the background and the foreground like in Virtual Boy Wario Land, a top-down dungeon section similar to the Legend of Zelda series, and a mini-game identical to the original Mario Brothers arcade title. Despite receiving high praise at the show and getting good coverage in magazines like GamePro and EGM, Mario Bros. VB never got shown again. It's unknown as to why the game was cancelled, or if it progressed any further than the CES demo. Some have theorized that the demo eventually evolved into Mario Clash for the Virtual Boy, but this is yet to be confirmed by Nintendo. In 2016, video game preservation website Nintendo Player released an article discussing an odd concept art piece from their collection. The art was a five-panel storyboard of Mario running through what looked like to be ruins of a building. Mario steps over a stone slab, which suddenly sprouts eyes and legs, turning into a womp-like creature. Little was known about the storyboard until Nintendo player tracked down the original owner to a man named Patrick Michael Clark, former lead artist at the now-defunct Redmond-based Boss Game Studios. After contacting another dev at Boss Game, Nintendo player confirmed Patrick's board was drawn in the mid to late 90s for a pitch that died on the vine after Nintendo saw the concept art. Following this failed project, Boss Game Studios would begin making third-party games for the Nintendo 64, including Top Gear Rally and Stunt Racer 64. The company shut its doors in 2002, following issues finding publishers for their future titles. Years before the Game Boy Advance, there was a Game Boy successor in the works codenamed Project Atlantis. Nintendo collaborated with Advanced Risk Machines, or ARM, to develop a 32-bit handheld that reportedly used a 160 MHz processor, 4 
buttons and a color LCD screen. In the April 1996 issue of EGM, news of the system was followed by a rumor that Nintendo was working on a game called Mario's Castle, potentially the Atlantis' launch title. However, other than this single blurb in EGM, no mention of Mario's Castle exists publicly. Even if it did exist, it's unlikely that any work was done on it aside from a few rough ideas on paper. Masato Kuwahara, project leader on the DSi, revealed in a 2009 Game Developers Conference talk that Nintendo wasn't satisfied with Atlantis' graphics performance and so scrapped the project entirely. Mario's Castle did not get referenced during the Kuwahara-san GDC discussion, which further supports the theory that production did not go very far, or perhaps even start. One of the few cancelled games starring Mario's arch-rival Wario would be Wario Pool for the Game Boy Color. In 2001, veteran British developers Nick Pelling and Jeff Ferguson pitched a pool billiards game to Nintendo featuring the titular anti-hero. Little was known about the pitch until Pelling released a short video on his website, giving us a small glimpse of the game's plot. Late one stormy night, Wario receives a phone call from his manager asking if he'll be in the yearly pool championships. Wario says no. Suddenly, two literal pool sharks appear on TV, scoffing that nobody, not even Wario, can beat them at pool. Now furious, Wario decides to join the championships. According to Nick Pelling, despite getting rejected by Nintendo, the Wario pool engine wasn't wasted. It was retooled and used for the Game Boy Color game 3D Pocket Pool, released only in Europe. Mario Artist Soundmaker was planned as the fifth entry in the Mario Artist series for the N64 disk drive, the console's Japanese-only add-on. Developed by the Manchester-based studio Software Creations, Soundmaker was originally bundled with Mario Artist Paint Studio as a single product. However, due to political infighting between Nintendo of America and Nintendo HQ in Japan, the game split in two. While Paint Studio had a Japanese release in December 1999, Sound Studio would never see store shelves. The game was likely canned due to 64DD being a commercial failure, and probably only went as far as a few bare-bones prototypes. An August 1999 article from IGN reported that an unrelated game also called Soundmaker was being planned alongside three additional titles, Game Maker, Video Jockey Maker, and Graphical Message Maker. Contrary to popular belief, none of these games had any connection to the other Soundmaker, or the Mario franchise in general. These were actually a part of a Maker series for the 64DD by developer Randnet. Another planned game for the 64DD would be Super Mario 64 2. Believed to be started around August of 1997, Shigeru Miyamoto and several other Mario 64 team members began working on a co-op system where Mario and Luigi were controlled by a single player, much like Olimar and Louie in the Pikmin series. This idea was inevitable, as a similar split-screen system was briefly tested during the first Mario 64. According to Miyamoto, a functioning co-op prototype was created, but got put on hold to focus on the upcoming Zelda 64. However, after Zelda's production went on much longer than expected, it was made clear that Mario 64 2 would be a late release on the N64 if it were to continue development. In a November 1998 interview with Nintendo Power Source, Miyamoto remarked, Well, for over a year year now at my desk, a prototype program of Luigi and Mario has been running around on my monitor. We have been thinking about the game, and it may be something that could work on a completely new game system. Miyamoto's decision to redo the project from scratch would result in a tech demo for the Nintendo GameCube. This was the start of Super Mario 128, a game so infamous that we've already written an entire video on it. Directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi, a demo was unveiled at Space World 2000 that showed a large 8-bit Mario sprite spawning smaller Marios until the numbers of characters on screen reached 128. The mini Marios would move around a saucer-like plane, interacting with random objects as well as each other. Although Mario 128 was never intended for commercial release, the demo's rapid generating element would find its way to another GameCube game. As said by Miyamoto in a 2007 GDC speech, the one question I'm always asked is, what happened to Mario 128? The purpose of that demo was to show how the new technology in the GameCube could could dynamically change the nature of Mario games. So when people ask me what happened to it, I'm always at a loss as to how to answer it, because most of you have already played it. But you played it in a game called Pikmin. In the same speech, Miyamoto revealed that Mario 128's fear-walking gravity mechanic would be implemented in an upcoming game for the Nintendo Wii. That game was Super Mario Galaxy, which was also directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi. When the Game Boy Advance was publicly unveiled at GDC on April 10, 2000, it was presented alongside two tech demos. One, a game where you controlled a baby doll 
Dolphin Across the Ocean, and 2, a one-level remake of Yoshi's Story for the Nintendo 64. The demo included a new FMV intro, and excluded elements from the original game like Yoshi's ability to use his tongue and shoot eggs. While it was received positively, and even featured in some early GBA advertisements, the remake never saw release. It's unknown if Nintendo ever planned to do that in the first place. Two ROMs of Yoshi's Story GBA, plus their source code, were found within the handheld's SDK, and both are now safely preserved. Another unreleased tech demo for the GBA is Mario Kart XXL. In 2004, Denaris Entertainment Software, a Germany-based developer founded by Turrican creator Manfred Trenz, created a Mario Kart prototype as a pitch for Nintendo. The game was impressive with parallax scrolling and 3D graphics, but was unfinished due to the inability to pass laps, collect coins, and stop at walls. As per usual, the pitch got rejected for reasons unknown. In 2005, the company released a GBA port of Crazy Frog Racer, which used a seemingly similar engine as Mario Kart XXL. Perhaps this game has a small remnant of the demo within it, but it's hard to know for sure. A prototype cartridge was revealed in 2015 by a collector in the Netherlands, but it is yet to be released online as of this video. And this isn't the only vehicular game on our list. Information on the DS's Mario Motors is few and far between. During a conference at Reboot Developer 2018, Yut Saito, a veteran game designer best known for games like Odema and Seaman, revealed that he pitched a DS title to Miyamoto and Satoru Iwata about creating motor engines. Inspired by Saito-san's love of sculpting, the game would have the player, presumably as Mario, shave a metal chunk into the shape of a cylinder to create an engine. One mechanic in the game was to have the player breathe into the DS to teach them about acceleration, but this got scrapped as they thought it caused children to get out of breath. During the conference, several images of the design document were shown, one of which shows Mario working on the engine alongside an older scientist-type character, possibly a relative to the plumber. When asked why the title was never released, Saito said, I cannot tell you why, but please guess. Before making the Metroid Prime series, Retro Studios worked on a football simulator game for the GameCube. Beginning preliminary development in the summer of 1999, the original design was a Mario-themed family-friendly sports game a la Mario Tennis. According to programmer Jason Hughes, Nintendo wanted to capture a mature audience with the GameCube and suggested the game's Mario theme be dropped entirely. Development would resume in a more serious path, replacing Nintendo's characters with realistic players motion captured by the Dallas Cowboys. Originally intended as the exclusive football title for the GameCube, it became apparent that companies like Sega and Electronic Arts would be bringing their football games to the system, thus creating fierce competition. Retro Studios attempted to restart the game from scratch with a team of new designers, but they decided the better option was to cancel the game altogether. Despite having, among other things, fully functional networking support, a replay system, and a stadium renderer, the team dissolved in February of 2001, and development was halted indefinitely, never to resume. The football game would not be the only scrapped Mario game by Retro Studios. In May of 2020, concept art for a spin-off game starring Boo was found on the resume of artist Sammy Hill. Sammy, who had previously worked at Retro Studios on games like Metroid Prime 3, revealed on his now-defunct ArtStation profile that the title, codenamed Haunt, was planned for the Nintendo DS around 2006 to 2007. As we can read from the concept art, the game potentially revolved around a young Boo student fresh out of Haunt University. During graduation, Boo gets dipped in a mysterious green goop, which grants him special powers. Using these powers, Boo goes out to fight off witches, zombies, and piranha plants. In an interview with IGN, Hall revealed that the design for Haunt came from ex-Retro Studios leads Mark Pacini, Todd Keller, and Kynan Pearson, but got cancelled the week they went to create their other studios. Days after this interview was published, Hill's social media was mysteriously deleted. While we have no definitive answer for what happened, it's probably safe to assume there were some NDA-related issues. Super Mario Spikers is one of the most well-documented games on our list. Pitched by Next Level Games for the Wii, the title was first designed as Mario Volleyball, but quickly evolved to include elements of wrestling. It soon got renamed to Super Mario Spikers, which was a play on the soccer game Super Mario Strikers for the GameCube. As we can see from leaked concept art and animations, Spikers would have taken place on the set of a game show where Mario characters compete against each other. The winning team would move up to a grander location such as Donkey Kong Island. Note that the game went for a more violent approach by Mario standards, with characters able to stomp on and throw other players across the area. According to an anonymous
anonymous Next Level artist, Nintendo disapproved of the project as they believed the violent gameplay did not match the company code of honor. An early prototype of Spikers may still exist, but it's unlikely that that one will ever surface. Seven years before the release of Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle, Ubisoft Paris attempted a similar crossover game between the franchises. In an interview conducted by fellow Digino gaming researcher Liam Robertson, an anonymous Ubisoft developer revealed the company formed a subversive, self-aware take on the Mario franchise where the Rabbids wreak havoc on the Mushroom Kingdom. Sadly, for reasons unknown, Nintendo rejected the game before a formal pitch happened. All that remains is a single piece of concept art, which shows the Rabbids carrying Bowser away while Mario chases after them. According to Kingdom Battle director Davide Soliani, this pitch had no relation to the 2017 Nintendo Switch game. Did you know gaming attempted to reach out to Soliani for more information, but he couldn't share any additional details without permission from Ubisoft HQ. In November of 2018, Tesla founder Elon Musk was asked on Twitter if the company could add a Mario Kart game to their cars, one where players could race against other Tesla owners while both of their vehicles charge. To the user's surprise, Musk replied, We tried. Nintendo would not license it to us. Considering that Musk is an avid gamer that even included an Atari emulator with some Tesla models, this idea was not that far-fetched. While he didn't specify why Nintendo said no, some have theorized that the Big N had safety concerns there's a high chance that a driver could be badly injured while playing Mario Kart in a car, and that's something Nintendo would not want their brand associated with. On April 13th, 2013, Nintendo released a sizzle reel promoting the Wii U Virtual Console, including a port of the NES puzzle game Yoshi's Cookie. It never came out. No one knows why. Did you know that a 2.5D Mario title was rumored to be coming to the GBA near its launch? Or that there was supposedly going to be a crossover between Mario and Kingdom Hearts? For more facts, check out our video on Mario Rumors. We also highly suggest checking out and supporting groups like the Video Game History Foundation, Gaming Alexandria, Unseen 64, and Hidden Palace, as their hard work preserving video game history has made videos like these possible. Thanks for watching.